Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome once again to another one of our In Conversation series. And we're talking research uh, again today, but uh, a specific research product project. So I'm joined today by Andrew Rodham, Dr. Andrew Rodham, who is the Chief Executive of Our Future Health, which is a really, really exciting research product. Um, Andrew, straight in, tell us what Our Future Health is. Excellent. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come along and talk today as well. Um, so Our Future Health is going to hopefully be the UK's largest ever health research programme. And it really came about because, you know, despite many advances that we've seen in medicine over the past sort of 10, 15, 20 years, there are still sort of a significant amount of, of some people living in, in poor health in later life. So, you know, diseases like dementia, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, stroke continue to blight the lives of, of people in, in our communities. And particularly, you know, we really want to tackle that problem of how do you prevent, detect and treat those diseases earlier? rather than waiting till sort of very late stages where it's actually quite difficult to make a really significant impact to the population. Great. So uh, so tell us a little bit about uh, the mechanics of uh, of the programme. How does it work? Uh, where, where are the patients coming from? Yeah, so our future health is trying to build a community of 5 million volunteers over the age of 18 to sort of really look at people before they get disease, during that point when they start to show symptoms and then afterwards, so that you can really sort of unpick the sort of what's happening to individuals and what's happening to people. To join the programme, we're making this simple. So we're trying to recruit 5 million people, so it has to be quite simple because you can't make it very complicated to get that sort of numbers. Um, so we'll ask people to consent to join. Um, that consent will allow us to, uh, will, well, allow them to share their information with us. We'll ask them to complete a questionnaire around their sort of lifestyle and history before they join the programme so that we can understand a little bit about them. Um, the consent will also let us connect to the NHS data and potentially in the future other data sources so that you can start to build that picture of the individual and of the person and what, they, what happens to them over time. And we'll also be taking a blood sample from them. And that blood sample will be um, to enable us to look at the genetics in the blood, but also to keep a, a part of that sample for future research use. So whether that's to go back and test new diagnostics or some of the new technologies that even today we can't really think about what they're going to be in 10, 15 years time when the utility of, of the programme comes to bear. You know, that'll let us do all of those things. And we'll also be asking people to the ability to go back to them in the future. So to offer them feedback, to offer them the ability to take part in research, to ask, invite them along to different types of studies, interventions and, and programmes that will hopefully have an impact on them. So great. So people listen to this now, I imagine just about everyone listening to this now has gone and watching this has gone, wow, that's great. I mean, so how do I go about signing up? Where can I sign up? Does it matter where I am in the UK? So ultimately, it doesn't matter where you are in the UK. Um, you can now, at the moment, you can go to our website at ourfuturehealth.org.uk and sign up to receive email updates. Um, we piloted some program of how we recruit people last year and what we're going to be doing over the course of this year is starting recruitment at scale. Um, we will do it sort of regionally and roll it out. We won't try to go national on day one. Um, but we'll certainly, you know, for people who sign up, we'll be in contact with them, you know, as and when we're in the area. So we'll be using a range of different ways of recruiting people. We'll be working with, the, hopefully working with the blood donation service, hopefully working in some hospitals and also setting up some mobile portable clinic sites where people can go along and give their blood sample and finish the, the consenting and joining process. So Andrew, do you think uh, there's this issue uh, of, of data sharing that, that rears its head? It has done from the start. It's a, it is a bit of a, it's a bit of a, has been a bit of a barrier to development of some digital technologies. Yeah. Just sense as an investigator at the moment, have we have people recognised the value of willing to share data through what we're just living through at the moment with the pandemic? Um, I think certainly attitudes have changed in the past two years to where they were pre. COVID. Um, but I think people still have concerns, you know, sharing someone's health data or asking someone to share their health data with you is asking someone to share the most personal sort of insights about the individual. So, yeah, I suspect, you know, whilst we've made a lot of progress in how to share data, I think there's still always going to be scepticism in some and always going to be positivity in sharing amongst others. And really, I think for, for us as a programme, what we need to do is make sure that we're completely transparent about what's happening to that data. So 
you know, within the consent material, within the pre-information on our website, you know, working with industry, working with partners, the process and governance around accessing the data in the future with you know, an access board application process, and then also the security, the privacy and confidentiality that we treat the data in to give the reassurances and hopefully build trust with the, the, the participants that actually what they're signing up for is, is something that they want to be a part of and want to help sort of future generations live healthier lives for longer. Yeah, that's great. So, I mean, it's really interesting work. This. And I was reading, you're an epidemiologist by background, and I was, when I was reading about this and listening to you talk, I, I could never get beyond thinking about framing him really as a, <laughs> as a massive, great, you know, huge popular observational study. Yeah. didn't do anything, didn't it? We've got the concept of risk factors. Yeah. What do you think the future is for these kind of these kind of mega mega trials or I don't really a trial is it's an observational sort of series very very sophisticated observational sort of series now uh, in in population health are we going to be seeing more of these? I think generally I, my feeling is we've moved a long way in the sort of as you alluded to so framing and British doctors back in the 1950s and the birth cohorts yeah. They've all had such great advances. And I think you know, in recent times, you know, you'd look to buy a bank, Genomics England and others about how they're moving things forward. But I think we're now moving into a world where you know, the digital revolution around data and information about individuals is growing. And we can now understand a lot more about a person from understanding how they interact with things. But also it's people are starting to take more control of their own sort of life course and, and futures. So, I think seeing studies like Our Future Health, which will be able to track that over time, but then also be able to go back to those people and offer them interventions, which may not be the traditional ways of thinking about pills and medicines, but actually some of the behavioural changes that might happen earlier on, the sort of you know motivational apps that get you to do a little bit more exercise or that try to get you to sleep better or other things or train your mind around sort of preventing dementia. I think that's going to be a big part of the future. And because of the subtlety of those sorts of interventions, I think it's only through larger studies like Our Future Health, other sort of more digital ones where you can watch and passively monitor people, will you really get an insight as to whether those interventions are really happening? It's very different to the sort of environment where giving people medicines or running a test to see whether or not someone's got a disease or not. I think there's that, but this new world of understanding the sort of behavioural change in people, understanding empowering people to take control of their healthcare, and understanding the sort of profiling that you can do to better identify those who are going to benefit most from treatments, the sort of precision medicine, precision public health, whatever sort of, you know, new phrases come out over time to sort of describe that. I think that's going to be the sort of way that we look to the future so that we move from the society where we treat people who are really sick to getting people who are really sort of trying to live that healthier life for longer. No, that's great. It's really, really, uh, really interesting stuff, Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, so just remind us uh, one more time there on where, where do we go to sign up? Remind us of the website. Yep. If you go to ourfuturehealth.org.uk and you'll be able to find the sign up link and you'll get email updates, newsletters and hopefully in due course when we're in an area near you an invitation to join. Well, that's great. And so we'll put out we'll put out some collateral uh, when this goes out. And uh, and one thing you must do, Andrew, is come back and see us again. We'll have this conversation mm-hmm. again, maybe this time next year and see uh, and see what progress uh, has been made. And we're recording this uh, at the end of January 2022. Andrew, thanks very much for your time. It's a great pleasure. Thanks. to see you. Thank you. Love to come back.